Frank Gal, Sean McCauley. That's correct. How are you gentlemen doing? I'm doing all right. I do okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good. Thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, we are, this is kind of like a specialty podcast. Very rarely do I do one uh, where I am, you know, favoring one way. I kind of stay neutral, but uh, I, I strive to be objective in this. Uh, if I ask questions for clarification, um, you know, if you can provide any insight you can to any of the listeners. Uh, I'll, I'll start off with giving your guys the introduction. So Frank. I'm Frank Gale. Uh, I was a, uh, I was with the Denver Sheriff's department for 26 years where I worked at all levels of the organization um, from deputy all the way up to division chief. I spent my last two years with the, uh, the agency as a division chief. Um, and uh, I was on our local board in the FOP when we got bargaining rights in 1995. So I was one of the people instrumental in getting bargaining rights for the Denver Sheriff's Department. Um, and I uh, have held various offices in the, in the FOP throughout the last 30 years. I have been local vice president and president. I was state vice president and state president. And I was uh, national sergeant at arms and national vice president, second vice president of the FOP. Um, uh, I, I was national second vice president for eight years and national sergeant number three. I was state president for eight. Um, so I've been in FOP leadership for a long time. Uh, been been doing representation and advocacy of law enforcement officers for 30 years. Right on. And Sean? I'm Sean McCauley. I'm the uh, principal at McCauley and Roach. Uh, I am also the general counsel for the Colorado State Labor Council. I have been practicing law for 24 years, and of all 24 years, I have done primarily and almost exclusively labor and employment law. Uh, and I've represented the Fraternal Order of Police in four states over those 24-year period. Uh, I represent uh, lodges in Kansas City, Missouri, most of Kansas, uh, Oklahoma, and then in Colorado. I've been the general counsel in Colorado since 2012, I think, and uh, have been working out here actually since 2004. I started uh, in 2004 with my old firm working on behalf of the Lodge 27 deputies. And uh, then uh, in 2011, 2012, we formed the Labor Council. And so I've been representing uh, law enforcement officers in collective bargaining negotiations in Colorado since then. I believe right now we represent about uh, 16 departments uh, that have or are, have acquired bargaining. And that would be in addition to the 45 or so that I represent in the three other state in I guess the three other states of Missouri, Kansas, and Colorado, or excuse me, Oklahoma. Okay. Yep. Right on. Wealth of knowledge between the two of you. So hopefully we can shed some light on this collective bargaining process. Um, I know just former employee of Aurora, Aurora had collective bargaining. Um, it, I guess the new legislation came out and uh, it's allowing county employees to collectively bargain. Um, commonly termed unionizing, but as Frank was explaining before we started rolling, if you want to explain the difference, why the FOP is not solely a union and why, uh, you know, it, it does collective bargaining. Yeah, I mean, so Fraternal Order Police is uh, an organization that is actually called a Fraternal Benevolent Association. Um, under the IRS code, um, you have different types of corporations, um, and so the, the FOP is a Fraternal Benevolent uh, uh, benevolent uh, association, which is a 501c8. Uh, a union, a typical union, uh, is a 501c5. Um, it changes kind of some of your reporting requirements, some of the things you have to, you know, uh, file documentation for annually with the Department of Labor and with other uh, federal agencies about your activities and what you're doing with your members' money. Um, the Fraternal Order Police really is a, a much broader uh, type of an organization than, than just a union and the reason for that is because most most law enforcement officers come into the FOP for legal defense because we have the best legal defense plan on the planet okay um, it's, it's it's the best one we have more members in it nationwide and statewide than anybody else and it's because doing the work that you do as a law enforcement officer um, you know you're gonna need a lawyer sooner or later you know if you get into a shooting you have a critical incident um, you know Maybe you have some situation where, uh, you know, your employer is trying to discipline you. Um, you want some legal advice and you need to have legal advice because what we do is so very specific um, and so fraught with, very honestly, a lot of liability, especially in the current climate. 
uh, that you need you need legal representation. And so most people come to us for that, but we provide way more than that. And what you see with FOP organizations is we do a lot of uh, a benevolent type of work. You see us doing charitable work in communities, you know, shop with a cop, and you see the FOP lodges that are doing uh, things with youth sports groups or youth community groups, and where we're providing funding with that. Um, one of the things we do in the Colorado FOP through our foundation is we have a child ID program. I mean, these are, so FOP lodges are typically doing a lot of those things. And then we do things that are specifically designed to help members who uh, are either in s sick or in distress or they have family members who are sick or in distress. We'll do fundraisers for those, for those groups. These are things that, that are not typically done by most unions. Um, and some unions are doing them, but, but mostly we are organized to do those kind of things. The, I mean, the purpose of the Fraternal Order of Police at, at all levels um, is to improve the quality of life of our members and their families. That's really our creed. That's, that's what we're, we're here to do. We're not here to do anything other than that. And so that's why we have a legal defense plan. Um, and that's why you know, we, we do fraternal uh, uh, benevolent uh, type of activities. And that's why we do community activism and community things. And then the other thing we do uh, that we're very well known for and, and, you know, in Washington, D.C. and in the state of Colorado is our legislative advocacy. And so these are things that are being done regardless of whether or not uh, our members have collective bargaining in their particular agency. And that's why we already have so many members. That's why we have members, because we're already doing work uh, that, that relates to that advocacy on behalf of members. So you about 30 years in FOP leadership? Yes. How long has the FOP been doing collective bargaining as a, in addition to all of those other things? So in the nationwide, the FOP has been doing collective bargaining since the 40s. There's been FOP organizations doing collective bargaining since the 40s, but they haven't been doing it everywhere in the country because, you know, every state's different and the legal authority to do collective bargaining is different in every state. Um, we've been doing collective bargaining in, the, in Colorado uh, since uh, I think the first FOP lodge that we started doing bargaining with here was uh, in the mid 90s. Okay. And so we've been doing it since probably 93, 94, 95. Um, and, and that was, I want to say, you know, uh, Denver SO was one of the first FOP lodges to get bargaining. So was Commerce City uh, PD. Um, and, and they, you know, both of them got it, I want to say, 94, 95 ish. Um, and we've been doing it in those places since then. Okay. So to say you have experience or the FOP has experience in doing this, it's fair to say that. Well, right? I, I would, <laughs> it's more than just experience. Nobody does more collective bargaining. Right. for law enforcement officers in this country or in this state than the Fraternal Order Police. Right. Bar none. That's it. We're, we're, you know, we currently are assisting uh, FOP lot, local FOP lodges in bargaining in uh, 16 different places, the jurisdictions. Um, it, you know, we, the only sheriff's department that we've done was Denver because they got it by a local referendum. Um, and, th and they were allowed to do that in Denver based on their, you know, the city and county charter. But this, this new state law is what established bargaining rights for all county employees. And that this is now uh, the reason why uh, lodges are, are asking us about how does this work and, you know, uh, what do we need to do if we want to see if our members want to do want collective bargaining. And that's, that's what this whole effort is about, is us just saying, let's show you how you get this done. Let's show you how you get organized and let your members decide whether or not this is something they really want to do. So one thing uh, that I've heard from individuals that are going through this process, right now we have Arapahoe County, uh, Elbert County, Douglas County, Boulder County is getting ready to start. And uh, Boulder County is recognized. They're about ready to start okay. their negotiations okay. on next, a week from today. Okay. Um, and then Adams County, have they? Adams hasn't filed yet. Okay. Although they have, um, they have gathered their, their petition cards. Okay. Um, and so we haven't filed them with the Department of Labor yet, but. But they've they've given them to us to file. So they've they you know we they've definitely reached out and done the things they need to do to show a significant uh, interest in doing this. Um, so I think we just right now it's Los Animas, <clears throat> Los Animas County has been recognized. La Plata County has been recognized. Elbert County 
has been recognized. They haven't been recognized. We're about to. Oh, have that's their, right, because we haven't had the election. Wait, their election in is, yeah it starts the, in about a week. Yeah. Okay. We, yeah, we haven't had the election in Elbert. So one thing, uh, one thing that was brought up, uh, brought to me was that during this process, the FOP can say anything, promise anything, and and lie to get this established at agencies. If you guys can chime in on that. Well, like, I guess. Uh, you know, first of all, um, as Frank kind of described, with this change in the law and it affecting a new group of people within the state of Colorado, uh, we've received a lot of questions from even non-members, but members of the of these of the FOP that haven't been bargaining that work for these counties that are covered by the process, and they're familiar with the process generally because many of the police departments within their own county are doing collective bargaining so they're aware of it or they worked like you for a department potentially that had that before you went to work at a place that didn't um and so when that when when the law passed we actually had a six-month period before it actually went into effect it it became law in january but it didn't really start until july 1st of 2023 do you know uh so for the listeners that want to look into it do you know the actual law like is it it's called it's 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 called the County Collective Bargaining Act for County Employees, I think. Okay. Um, it's COPCA. Uh, you can find it on the Department of Labor's website under labor laws. Um, it's a little bit hard to find because it's a newer law, and the way it was codified makes it a little bit tough to find it in a normal search because it's so new. But if you want to, if you want to find the law and read the law, the Senate bill that was passed, uh, is there's a link on the Department of Labor's website. Okay, and I'll include it in this episode. Sure, for yeah, and I can, we can provide that to you, Perfect. make it easy. Um, but anyway, so because we had a lot of questions, we went around and we, we wanted to just explain to people what this was. And... And as Frank could attest to, when we made these presentations, this was not an idea of this is what you ought to do or should do or must do. It was more of an informational piece on what this is all about and why we're doing it in in certain places and how we've been successful in those places. And there's never been a single piece of misinformation that we've ever provided in those uh, in those presentations that everyone has ever said was a problem. And in fact, um, I gave almost the exact same presentation to a group of employee and uh, management labor lawyers in Colorado. I was asked to give a presentation uh, jointly with actually the attorney that is representing Douglas County and Arapahoe County uh, just to bring those lawyers kind of up to speed as to what happened. It was the exact same presentation. Uh, just talking about the the issues of the law, how it works, uh, and then what happens. And let them make a decision about if it's right for them, and if it is, we would help them try to achieve it. And so th- to say that there's been lies or that we would lie, we, first of all, I- I'm an attorney. I'm, I'm an officer of the court. Uh, me going around lying can have some significant repercussions on my ability to practice law. They can um, debar you. That's correct. Right. I can be disbarred. Um, it could be sanctioned, but I could also ruin my reputation. And to me, uh, as a lawyer, more than just being disbarred is, there, is being looked at as a liar. And so we would never go around and mislead anyone about what this is because they need to be informed and make a decision for themselves. And that's really what we've done to try to educate folks that have not been familiar with the process. And many of them, after hearing the presentation, recognize the value that is collective bargaining in law enforcement. And to be honest with you, the, the, the group of employees in the United States that meet that need bargaining more than anyone are law enforcement officers, especially where we're at uh, in today's age. Well, I can, I can agree with you there in the essence that they give so much to their communities every single day. And, um, you know, it's unfortunate, uh, that, you know, it ultimately we have to go through the process of collectively bargaining to get better benefits for these individuals that should just be the red carpet should be rolled out for them. But we live in America and this is a real, this is a real world situation, right? With, uh, with a lot of things going on with a lot of different counties. Um, I know I, I I'm having someone on from Arapahoe County to kind of explain the unique thing that they're in. But what I've been hearing is, their pay is getting frozen because of collective bargaining. Everything's being halted because of collective bargaining. And then I've heard the other side of the coin of, well, there was a broke county to begin with and nothing was going to get passed because they didn't have any money to begin with. 
I would say that the it's the latter of those two for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, the collective bargaining process has not resulted in a wage freeze in Arapahoe County. Uh, Arapahoe County's financial situation is resulting in a number of cutbacks that I think are well publicized within the entire county, not just the sheriff's department. And they're, they they have grave concerns about their financial situation going forward because they have more money going out than coming in, and that's a problem. Um, but that really existed long before the collective bargaining process started. And in fact, the sheriff was asked to cut budgets long before that. And in the end, um, we have to deal with that circumstance. And what another thing that I've heard is that this process will bankrupt the county. And the reality is when you're collectively bargaining, there's two main issues that you have to look at. And the first is, can the county or the city afford what the employee organization is proposing? And if they can't, no matter how beneficial or widespread that benefit would be in other places surrounding them in comparable jurisdictions, it doesn't matter. If they can't afford it, no one will force them to agree to something they cannot afford. And we understand that. That's that's part of our analysis in determining the strategy and direction that we want to go. And we, we recognize that that is going to be a challenge in Arapaho, but it had nothing to do with the process. And it had more to do with the county's finances long before this process ever started. So would you say that, uh, is it a good summary to say it's political propaganda against collective bargaining? I would say that it is a, it's a, certainly a misleading statement for people that have a certain political agenda to avoid the process. Okay. Um, speaking of the process, if we go down, uh, if any agency goes down the route of collectively bargaining, and uh, just kind of explain the process for somebody from the point of, do we meet with you, gentlemen, to talk about what we're looking for? How do you reach out to the lodge to figure out what we're looking for and, and, and things like that? So before anything's up, yeah, someone would have to reach out to us and say, hey, we're interested in this. Provide us some information. Tell us how to go about it. And then we, we'll do that. We hold informational meetings for, for whoever requests them. Um, Sometimes they even ask us, and I've had this happen, you know, what do you, do you think? Do you think this is something we should do right now? Should we wait? You know, what, where does it stack up at? And really, it's the individual group's decision to, to, to decide that. Uh, I can give some advice, and sometimes I give advice and say, yeah, if I was you, I'd wait. Or I'd say, you know, um, you guys are in a position right now where you could probably uh, make this happen because um, you got enough people working on it. You have enough people that are interested. Um, so that's that's how it starts, and then we just get you some, you know, we get we get you some legal advice. That's why Sean's here. He tells you how the law works, and you know, he does all the legal filings for, you know, for for the group, the FOP lodges, um, to to move forward. Once that's done, and and then we have then they set they set an election. Once the election is over, if the FOP is selected as the bargaining agent, um, then we go to the FOP lodge and we say, okay. You, we're going to start preparing for negotiations. You guys got to decide who's going to be on your negotiation team. We don't come in and negotiate the agreement and then bring it back to you and say, oh, here's your agreement. We just we negotiated this. Here it is. You guys, you know, whoever you, you people decide, whatever group we're talking to, whatever they decide is that's who's on the, the team. And we may accompany them in negotiations. Sean is an attorney. And so if you're part of the, the Colorado FOP Labor Council, he will be provided to you um, to help you with that process and guide you through negotiations because obviously people who haven't done it before will need that, that expertise and that guidance. Um, I may or may not participate or some other people from the state FOP may or may not participate uh, depending on the needs of the particular FOP organization. Um, so, and then that's, you know, we negotiate the agreement based on what those representatives from that particular FOP lodge and that, that, that agency tell us is what they need. Um, one of the things we also provide in Labor Council, uh, we talked about, you know, the situation in Arapaho. Arapaho County, uh, FOP was part of the Labor Council um, prior to them even trying to establish uh, collective bargaining rights. And one of the things that, you know, member lodges get is we get a, a financial analysis. We'll go to their, their county or their city and we will have an expert, a person who um, is, is an expert and well-versed in how to do this, who, you know, 
will tell us this is what this is what their finances look like. This is how much revenue they have, and this is how much, uh, you know, this is where their their money is laid out. This is how they spend their money, um, and this and give us a picture of basically what they call ability to pay, so that we're not starting from a place of we're going to be asking for something that we know they can't afford. We just don't do that because that's just a non-starter. It's a non-starter. You know, the, the whole process in collective bargaining um, is that both sides have to come to an agreement. And that's why when you, are, you know, when you have a completed negotiation process, what you have is a collective bargaining agreement. What people refer to the contract, they say the collective bargaining contract, it's a co collective bargaining agreement because both sides agreed to it. If we don't show up and say, you'll do this, and the management says, okay, we have to do it because that's what you said. It doesn't work that way. Um, so both parties have agreed to it. You're not going to get an agreement if you're going and asking for something they can't afford. You just, it just won't happen. Um, so that's, that's kind of how the process works. And I, 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 you know, I, I didn't go through all the legal steps of it because I think Sean's probably a better to, to yeah. describe that. Yeah, and so it, it's good to hear because a lot of what uh, was told to friends of mine is that, well, you're going to trust somebody from out of the state uh, to push for benefits for you. And from what you just said, it's us pushing for the benefits. You guys are just like our cheerleaders, our support, our coaches. Sure. And um, so after we, after you get that information from us, where does that go to from there? So, you know, just to kind of hit on that a little bit further, you know, we send out a survey once the bargaining process is going to begin asking the members, you know, what do they think can be improved within the department or what can be added that you think will improve the department? And we'll get a significant amount of feedback at times from the membership, some of which are things that we can't do. Um, do you have on, an example? Well, for instance, in, in Denver SO, um, they, they are bargaining under a charter amendment to the, to the city and county's home rule charter. And that charter amendment expressly says that you cannot bargain over retirement benefits. But every year we send out a uh, you know, an information request to the membership, and inevitably we, re we get hundreds of people saying we need to improve the retirement. And that's not something we have any control over in the bargaining process. Because We're limited the to the Yes, because of the mandatory nature of, of certain subjects and some that are prohibited and under their charter uh, as passed by the voters, that's a prohibitive subject. So Can there, I get clarification sure. there, though? Yeah. So under this new state legislation... Is it prohibited to talk about retirement benefits? It is not prohibited. Okay. Um, I, I can tell you that uh, that contributions to the retirement system uh, can be discussed, but it really depends from county to county, the system that they're in, how how much that's going to be able to be negotiated. Meaning like defined benefit versus like a 401A, 401K. Right. If it, the, the closer you get to a defined contribution, the more likely it is you can bargain over that because the county or the city – uh, is controlling the contribution level in terms of the match or the amount that they're willing to contribute, and that would be negotiable. Okay. And that's one of the things we would look at if members um, in a place where uh, under the county collective bargaining law told us in the survey that they, the retirement was an issue, then we would do some specific analysis around that, that individual retirement system right. and see what is, what's it doing now. Is it defined benefit? Is it defined contribution? What what is the employer providing versus what the the, the employee uh, donating into it or, or or providing into it, and then we would we would do a, some kind of a financial analysis around how that would work, and then come back and, and say, this is something that's viable for us to negotiate over, or you know what, this is not something that we're going to really be able to help with, or we can't help with the whole thing, but we can do this other piece that will enhance it. it that's gen that we do this kind of deep dive analysis. We don't just we don't fly by the seat of our pants because right. we're just too experienced for that. And it doesn't, it doesn't sound like there's a one, one size fits all. It's a very individually approached process with each individual agency. 100%. Yes. Okay. So uh, just for clarification, because this was brought up from, uh, from, again, people I talked to, moving from a, like a 401A program or a 401K to a pension program would be difficult to do is is what you're saying i think it, there's a lot of challenges in that process okay. and the reality is i most issues can kind of there's there's two issues to making a change there's a philosophical issue and a cost issue um when it comes to retirement 
you have to get over both hurdles. Sure. So one, you have to be able to talk to the employer and explain the value of changing the system that's already been in place. And that is a, normally not an over-the-night process. And the reality is collective bargaining is not an over-the-night process. Um, this is not a short-term fix uh, if, if, there's, if there's an issue that needs to be resolved, it normally takes some time to do that because both parties recognize these aren't turn the light switch on and off type things that we can just change immediately. But really, it's about the dialogue. And so, for instance, that issue uh, happened, as you described, with the retirement, a changeover from a 401A to a traditional defined benefit FPPA type of retirement in multiple jurisdictions, including Longmont. Three years ago, they agreed to to enter into FPPA, but that took us the better part of six to seven years to get them to that, and it involved a lot of work on both parties' part to get to a point that they both felt comfortable with it. That's what we're trying to achieve. That type of relationship is what could be fostered in this process if everyone is on board to look at the issues with an open mind and to have the discussions about some of the pitfalls that either party might see in making such a change. But if you don't have the discussions, no change is ever possible. And really boiled away, the collective bargaining process, despite all the laws and all the rules, is really about talking. And we value that discussion. We think that there's nothing more important than being able to talk with someone that controls your career about your career. And if anyone is afraid to have that conversation, there's a serious problem. And to me, the reality is if you want your agency, department, any, of you, any, any uh, company to be the best it can be, you want to have the dialogue with the employees so they can tell you what's actually wrong. Because there's no sheriff in this state, big or small, that can tell you every problem with his department. But if we get an opportunity to have regular and required discussions, those issues get brought to light and they get solved. And it works. And they're established conversations. It's not just, hey, this sheriff is doing a great job. He's talking to us every you know, two months. Right. And then a new sheriff comes in and then we hear nothing. These are established lines of communication that proceed that that continue on. That's correct, and and there we you know almost every one of those collective bargaining agreements have a labor management process to unearth those problems before they become really big problems, and 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 those prevent lawsuits. Those save the county money in terms of there's inefficiencies that are going on because no one can be possibly aware of all of those. And if you're not speaking to the people that are actually doing it on a regular basis, it's really difficult to identify them. And that's why I believe in the process. And that's really what we use the process for as an FOP. Right. We, do, we have a completely different outlook about why and how we go about doing this than most other unions. And we're about bringing a level of intelligence and information to the process and not banging our fists on the table. Yeah, and, and I think that's the difference between, like, the Teamsters. And you just saw the congressional hearing with him where one of the congressmen's like, you want to throw hands? We'll throw hands right now. And the guy was like, sure, let's go for it. Right. And the communication I've had with the FOP regarding this, it seems a much more, um, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. team effort to better the agency overall. Well, I mean, and this is, I mean, the difference between a collective bargaining system and a non-collective bargaining system, in a non-collective bargaining system, you can have great dialogue with, with uh, the employee and management. Um, there can be all these discussions, um, but they're not required. The other thing is, is that regardless of what you, you bring up, and I've seen lots of situations where you have management people who are very, uh, you know, engaged in dialogue and conversations with rank and file, but nothing gets changed. Um, and some of that is because it, you're talking about things that are beyond their control. Uh, you know, they, they're not the people who control the purse strings or something like that. Um, but, and, and some of it is because, you know, it's just lip service. Some of it is just, you know, they're talking to you and they're having, and they're, they're assuring you that they're going to do things for you. But the reality is there's no requirement for them to do that. If you have collective bargaining, there is a legal requirement for them to meet with you and have these discussions, and to have these discussions with you on an equal basis. Not, 
I'm the boss having a discussion with you. I'm letting you come talk to me about what you have to say. It's we're, we're going to meet as equals and we're going to talk as equals and we're going to we're going to treat each other with mutual respect. Um, and we're going to have a real discussion. Um, and no, we're not going to jump up and down on tables and beat our chest and and and, and, and act stupid because um, that's not conducive to getting an agreement. Um, but we are going to. Uh, in, you know, enforce our right to have that discussion mm -hmm. and to be able to talk about the things that we're allowed to talk about. Um, and, and that's what, that's what happens. It happens because now they'll, they'll have to meet with us. And a lot of places, there's no discussion going on. Um, and that's the issue. In a lot of places, there's, there's nothing happening. Management's not talking to, to, to rank and file people at all about anything. And they don't have to. But if they had this process, they will be talking to them. They will be talking specifically to rank and file officers. They will be talking to the representatives of those rank and file officers. So it doesn't ruin the line of communication because uh, there's agencies where there is good communication going on. And what is told to the employee is like, this is going to ruin our ability to have communications with you. We're not going to be able to talk to you uh, about things that you're, you're disgruntled about. Uh, we won't be able to tell you like we're going to be able to fix anything. We're just going to have to wait for the next collective bargaining process. Yeah, no, that, none of that's true. The reality is is that the only time that's true is if one side or the other wants to be obstructionist. So if hypothetically, and we'll get back to the process as far as the, the legal going down the rabbit hole, um, but hypothetically, if there is an issue that's brought up to command staff, command staff says, yeah, I'm more than happy to do that. Can a mid-year adjustment or mid-agreement adjustment be made to include that, that change? Certainly. Absolutely. Because you can, you can always in, you know, engage in negotiations, even in the middle of a contract, to amend a contract. Contracts okay. are amended all the time. You know, in the Denver Sheriff's Department, they had a one-year agreement that got amended twice. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> because... You know, it was a it was a one year agreement, and then they said, "Well, you know, we we need to talk about some other stuff." This happened just a few years ago. Okay. Um, yeah, one hundred percent. I mean, that you you would almost always throughout a two or a three year, a multi year agreement have something that comes up that no party anticipated, or for instance, um, Englewood uh, they they agreed to a six percent wage increase. Their city. Uh, decided that they wanted to put them in the most competitive position they could. They came back to them and said, "Listen, we need we want to give you an extra two percent this year to put us over the top that we are the top paid because we think that's important for recruitment and retention." Of course, we agree to that. And in the same sense, if they came back and said, "We agreed to six percent and we're going to have to lay off the entire department if we meet that," we're going to come back to the table and talk to them about that. Now they're going to have to be fair in the process and try to, to find a resolution to that that works also for the employee. And maybe but more vacation days. That's right. Or things yeah, like there, that. there's right. there's always things that you can discuss and find a resolution to that isn't unilateral on either party's part. Right. You want to try to avoid that unilateralism because that doesn't breed a very good relationship and it doesn't breed a good atmosphere within your agency or your department. And then going back to the process, so once you get. Once you meet with us, the employees, we give you what we're looking for. Where does it go from there? So, and we're assuming that we've already been recognized. I right. Assume. Yep. Yeah. Recognize so we're, the process. We're, we're, is good. we're in the process of getting ourselves into a position to go to the table. Well, mm -hmm. the, the first goal is we want to be able to present to the county a complete agreement that we think covers all the things that we're allowed to bargain over or that we maybe all agree that we can bargain over. Um, so we start the process of developing our initial proposal. That is a time-consuming process. And the one thing that I, I think is, is sometimes lost on folks that don't know a lot about the way employment law works in Colorado or elsewhere is they believe that because it's in the county's policy, it is somehow a legally enforceable benefit that if taken away, they would have some mechanism to go to court and say, you can't do that. Well, the reality is in Colorado and most states that they can change those unilaterally. They can take away a benefit unilaterally, and there's no repercussions for the employer. Whether it's because there's a change in the political structure or the political uh, direction of the county, and that happened in Jefferson County, 
when uh, more conservative folks were elected, they felt the benefits package in Jefferson County was too rich, so they started dialing it back. And there was nothing those deputies uh, in the sheriff's department could do, nor could the sheriff do anything. Um, so our real goal in the first round of the negotiation process is just to solidify what it currently exists. And I know that there's been statements made that the county will start at zero. So if our pay is at $75,000 for starting, when we go into negotiation, we start at zero and bargain up to 75,000. Well, one, that I think would be an unfair labor practice in Colorado. But more importantly, if they would be willing to do that, that that would be their reaction to having just to have discussions about what someone is paid, that tells you that their, their interest is not the same as yours and that you do actually need this protection. So to say that would occur, and I've heard other lawyers say this in these type of anti-organizational meetings, but it's never happened to me. I've started at Ground Zero in four different states and in all of them, we started at what's currently in place. Because especially now, if they gut the benefit package in Douglas County or in Arapahoe County or in Los Animas County and say we start at zero, how long do they expect people to stay there? Not very long. And where are they going to go? And the answer to that question is everywhere. Every agency in the state is hiring. Every agency would love to have a fully trained deputy from another county who has done the job. So to say that they'd be willing to do that is one, should be concerning to whoever, say, whoever is hearing that. But more importantly, it's just not reality. So back to where we start, we really look at trying to solidify those benefits and find 10 or 12 things that the memberships really believes can be something enhanced so that we are more attractive for new applicants and we are more attractive for our current employees who, as I just mentioned, have every opportunity to go anywhere in the United States and be a law enforcement officer because everyone is hiring. And so the reality is this isn't the boogeyman. We're gonna come with a wholesale change to everything in the county. Most counties are doing very well for their employees. We just wanna make sure that it doesn't change overnight. And we also recognize that there are certain things that need to be enhanced because everyone around them might be doing them. And if the county can afford them, for instance, on call, not every department pays on call. Some do, some don't. And the reality is that's something that law enforcement officers should be compensated for. It's a challenge when you're a person that has children and you have ball games like everyone else and you're on call and can be called away at a moment's notice, have to, have a, have to take two cars to a baseball game because you might get called out, you should be compensated for that. And if you're not being compensated for that and everybody else is, we need to have a discussion to even the playing field. So then after that process is done, if like you go you go to the uh county we'll, we'll focus on counties because that's really what this new law is sure. about yeah i think it's pretty well established with cities and municipalities yes um so if a county is going down this route and you bring a package to them and they say no we don't like that they want to stonewall you and they say we're not interested in dealing with you we don't like this process so we're just going to delay it intentionally okay so what's the next process after they come back and they say, we agree to nothing in this contract? Well, the, the law calls for what is commonly referred to as interest arbitration. And what, the reason it's called interest arbitration is really there's, there's multiple types of arbitration throughout the United States in different fields. But in the labor and employment sphere, um, there's interest arbitration, which involves an inability to get to an agreement during a collective bargaining process. And then there's grievance arbitration. And grievance arbitration is we have an agreement in place. Someone feels, one of the parties feels the other is violating it. They file the grievance and the arbitrator is going to resolve that dispute so that the parties don't have to spend three years in court. Um, it's a very valuable process. But the interest arbitration process that's called for under, the, under COPCA um, would then put the parties in a hearing to explain their respective positions with regard to 
at either one or two issues or in your, in your um, hypothetical, every issue. And the county in that, in your hypothetical, would then have to answer to the arbitrator as to why they've made no movement at all. And in fact, that would likely be bargaining in bad faith, which is prohibited by the statute. Um, and again, 24 years in, it's never happened to me. Even in the most averse places that to a collective bargaining process, and actually there are very few of those in my, you know, of the departments I represent, but of those few, even there, we got to an agreement on many issues. Um, and it's very hard for them when I put their sick leave policy into the collective bargaining agreement and say, we just like that to be the same as it currently is for them to say no. And I actually would look forward to them explaining that to a neutral arbitrator as to why they couldn't agree to that. And their lawyers know that. And the reality is the leverage there is embarrassment because you're going to have a learned arbitrator who understands the rules tell a county in a public document that you don't know what you're doing. And that will be detrimental to the county forever. And so there's the, for them to believe that there is no risk in taking such a position is, uh, is misguided. But in the end, I've never had that happen. And believe me, every time we've started this process, everyone threatens to do that. But they realize once they get into the process that that is detrimental to their own mission. And in the end, the reality is in almost 95% of our cases of negotiating in, in Colorado, but much less for me anywhere, we don't have to go to the arbitration process because we arrive at an agreement. Because we're there to work. We're there to get the job done. We're there to find places where we can agree. And if we can't, we'll find something that we both can live with and then we can move on. And then just uh, just a nuanced question there. Yes. So uh, hypothetical, because I, I don't think any county's gotten this far. No, not in, at all. In, in any of this. No. Um, so this is all purely hypothetical, but Correct. falls within the law. So if, if you uh, go with an agreement, I know I called it a contract earlier, it's an agreement. If you go to this arbitration process with an agreement, and then the county kind of folds and saying, okay, well, we're willing to do this, this, and this, but not this, and we're going to, we're going to haggle on this at what are we then included again? The, uh, I, I forgot what council you called it, Frank, but the, um, the Colorado FOP labor council, the labor council would then meet with the individual workers there at the, at the specific lodge. Well, what would happen is we would get the decision from the arbitrator. Okay. And then the law would require us to continue bargaining right. based on what that arbitrator has given us as guidance in that decision. Okay. And that document is public that the media and and certainly the constituents of the county would be aware of right. and or feel and have the ability to discuss those with not only the county commission who's in charge, but us. Um, and you use that as a mechanism by which we try to come together on certain issues. And for instance, if an issue went against us and the, and the arbitrator ruled that the county's position is more accurate and, and, and more correct, um, we're going to probably say, okay, we, we've had our day in court. We've, we've had an arbitrator tell us that, hey, this is just not, uh, not something that's viable for whatever reason, and we're going to reach an agreement because that, we, we think there's value in the agreement. Right, and, that, and that's more so based on fair, fair market stuff, right? So like, that's this correct. is what other yeah. agencies are yeah. providing. Um, or ability to pay. Right. Right. Which is a Rappahoe's mm -hmm. kind of conundrum right now. Sure. So my next question is, is if both parties disagree to the arbitration process, they cannot come to a resolution. What is the next process? Well, I, I'm, I'm just going to be honest with you. That, that is something that's not fully explained in the in COPCA. Okay. Um, but I think that if one party intentionally refused to follow the arbitrator's decision, there could be legal action. But we hope we can avoid that. For the bad faith. That's right. You know. That's right. Well, okay. bad faith negotiations. I mean, so, and that would be at the start of negotiations if you had, uh, you know, the management attempting to not negotiate or not to participate in the process. There are, there are, there are things we can do under the law um, through the Department of Labor to, uh, to enforce the law. And the Department of Labor would be the, the, uh, the agency that would, that would take the enforcement action. Against the said county. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, okay. and, and the one thing I wouldn't mention is that 
this uh, this law was passed by essentially the current legislature. And if counties began to ignore the process, um, I feel confident in saying that the legislature who passed this same law would come back and give it the more teeth that they're... Amend it. That's correct. They can. And they believe in this process. That's why they passed it. And so they... If if a county decided to to put put its nose up towards the legislature, I feel like that the legislature was likely to respond in a way that the county won't be happy with. Yeah, I think everybody. Uh, my general sense is like everybody just wants to mind their p's and q's through this process. Yes. Unfortunately, certain counties have not. Um, but I do have a I do have a list of questions. I just want to because they were, they were submitted to the FOP uh, and friends of mine. And to get some more clarification, uh, so it says, what will collective bargaining do to the discipline process, if anything? Well, it depends on what we negotiate. Um, it, is, it is something that we could negotiate over, and so we would likely want to put in place uh, a process that says this is what happens when a person is, is accused of misconduct and they're under investigation through internal affairs, um, and this is what the rights of that officer is to kind of no information. Um, the management would still be the, the making the decision around who gets disciplined and what kind of discipline they would get um, because that really is the right of the management. However, the processes of how that happens and how you know statements are taken and how evidence is reviewed, those are things we could negotiate over in a contract. Okay. And then uh, the next one is how long will a contract last if one is kind of they said a contract, but agreement. Yeah, contract, agreement. I mean, it depends. I mean, you can negotiate, you know, one, two, or three-year agreements. Um, and it really just going to – we we generally want to make our our decision around how long the contract should be when we, when we make the proposal uh, based on kind of some of the things we know about the economic situation of the county uh, and also what the will of the members uh, is, what they've told us in the surveys. Um, and then sometimes, you know, we'll want a longer agreement because we'll have, you know, some things that are not going into effect the first year, but they will go into effect the second year and the, or the third year of an agreement. And so we may want a longer one to do that. Um, sometimes we, we want it. We, we're not going to address a lot of different issues. And so we want to get back to the table quicker. So okay. we'll have a shorter contract. We'll, we'll have a shorter agreement that's only one year so that we can get back quicker and address things that weren't addressed in that agreement. So it's agreement to agreement. It's yeah, not right. established like we no. are forever going to be doing three-year agreements. No. Yes. Okay. And and I would say that across the state of Colorado, because of the uh, the accelerated market in terms of law enforcement officer pay, that most cities do not want to go longer than two years because they want to be able to adjust for what the market does. Sure. And so the reality is that a that a two-year agreement is the it would be the norm. Um, I would I think under Kopka they couldn't do more than five, which okay. would be very irregular to go that long. Right. Yeah. Uh, the next question: How much will it cost uh, the members of the FOP? Will non-members of the FOP at said agency be required to pay? So non-members don't pay anything because they don't pay FOP dues. Okay. Uh, this is you're not paying you're not paying to unionize. You know the, the this is what FOP lodges do. FOP lodges decide if they want the F, Colorado FOP Labor Council to assist them in any kind of labor advocacy, whether or not they have bargaining. Um, and if they decide to do that, then they can join the labor council, and then they pay dues. Part of their dues will be will go to pay the labor council, just like part of their dues goes to pay the legal defense plan. Um, so it just depends. If they, if they are a non-bargaining lodge, they can join the Labor Council, and it's $5 per month per member. And if they are a bargaining lodge, then it's $10 per month per member. Um, and that's it. I mean, that's, that is... So $10. $10, yeah. That the most you could ever pay for us to do this for you, for right. you would be $10 per month per member. Right. And then, again, non-members... They just get vicarious benefits through this process? Is that so if they're not members, we would you know, but they're members of the bargaining unit, which means they're members of the unit that the FOP is negotiating for inside that agency. Right. Generally deputies and sergeants is what it usually is. Um, and they're not members of the FOP, 
We negotiate raises and benefits. They get those raises and benefits. They, they benefit from that system. Um, they're not FOP members, so they don't pay dues. Right. And that's it. But they don't get the legal defense plan either if they're not members. And that's, right. you know, that's what we tell people. If you don't want to be a member, that's fine. But you're not going to get the legal defense plan. So if you, know, if you get into a shooting and you need a lawyer, you're not going to get one from us. You're going to pay for it out of your own pocket. Right. And I don't know a lot of cops that uh, can pony <laughs> up with, you know, uh, four, five, six, ten thousand dollars right um, around something like that. Yeah. I don't. I was going to also Trump. note that um, Frank was right. We we would owe what's called a duty of fair representation to the non-members. Our goal, obviously, is for people to recognize the value in FOP membership. And many times uh, when we have a, a significant portion of the department that are non-members, when we start the bargaining process, um, they, they're more apt to come on board and begin to pay dues because they see value in it. And like Frank said, the legal defense plan is by far the, the FOP's greatest selling point because it's basically driving with car insurance. And if you don't have it, you're driving without it, and they can take your house. Um, so the other thing I would note is that, uh, you know, we used to be able to collect an amount of money from non-members uh, in those situations because essentially they're benefiting, as Frank described, from all the work and the money that their brothers and sisters are paying, and they're not having to pay their fair share. So uh, for years, the, the Supreme Court said that it was constitutional for, uh, for organizations like the FOP to collect a certain amount of money, much, much far reduced from what their due, what dues would be, to pay for the costs associated with bringing to them the benefits that they enjoy, even though they're not a member of the organization. Uh, but the Supreme Court uh, overturned that uh, approximately 30-year precedent decision uh, in the Janus case, and so we can't collect that. But the reality is we think that the, the process becomes valuable enough that everyone wants to contribute so that their brothers and sisters aren't paying for them. Right. So let me say this. And, and when that decision came out, it's been, what, about five, six years ago? It's been I would say so. The Janus? Yeah. Yes. When okay. that decision came out from the, from the, from the U.S. Supreme Court um, that eliminated non-members having to pay some amount of money to be represented in a collective bargaining situation, um, we had FOP lodges that were doing bargaining and had membership. Um, how much do you think the membership went down in the FOP when that happened? Probably nothing. It didn't. Didn't go down at all. It just went up. Yeah. It just and membership increased. That's all that happened. Membership increases in the FOP because of the product we're bringing. You know, there's no place you're going to get our legal defense plan. There's no place you're going to get our off-duty legal plan. Okay, we're 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 unique in this. You're, there's no organization, even ones that represent uh, law enforcement, don't provide the level of benefits that we do, especially at the cost. You know, if you have a if you buy a brand new car today, just an average price brand new car, you're going to pay two hundred dollars a month in insurance on average. Mm -hmm. That's what you're going to pay, okay? And you can be an FOP member, you know, to have insurance for your career, for your livelihood, for about seventy dollars a month. That's yeah, about that's, our, a, that's about what most lodges are charging. Right. I mean, and that's even with the labor council. So that's with the CBA established. Yeah. yeah. So. Uh, the reality is, you know, that you can't you can't beat this. I mean, one of the things I like to say when we do these presentations to people, you know, we want you to have choices, and and people will make the decisions they want to make. We're going to tell you why this, you know, what this is and how it works, and we'll also tell you whether we think it's something good for you or not. We do that in presentations as well. I do a lot of that. I do way more of that than than Sean does even, um, but. The one thing I always say is, I'm not here to sell you anything. The job of the FOP, and the, and the only reason that we exist, is to improve the quality of life of our members and their families. All we're doing is bringing you things that are gonna improve that quality of life. What we have found, okay, and I've served in the FOP at all levels of the organization, what we found is collective bargaining is one of those tools that helps us improve those quality of life. Uh, for, for our officers, for, for, for the members of our organization. And the places where we have it, we're able to get good wages and benefits and better working conditions um, in a way that is, that, that is, that is, is better for us um, and is more comprehensive for us than not having it and that is more secure. Because what Sean was, was talking about earlier is 
If you have policies that give you great wages and benefits, that's fine. But they can come with the stroke of a pen, take those away, and you have no legal right to challenge that. But if we have a, an agreement in place, that's a contractual agreement. And it's enforceable as a contractual agreement. It's enforceable in the courts because we have an agreement. So um, that's, that's it. That's the reason why. We, if you, and if you, don't, if you don't want it, we tell people, if this is something that members don't want, that's fine because it doesn't really change our mission. We're still going to be here doing advocacy for, for, for rank and file law enforcement officers because we're still going to be doing legislative advocacy and we're still going to be doing legal defense. Um, and we're going to do those things. We're still going to be providing you know, fraternal benefit things, but we're not going to do uh, you know, the, 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 the best uh, application of advocating for your wages, your benefits, and your working conditions. Right. So all of the, everything we do, everything we do is about that. We don't, we don't make out. I don't personally benefit. I'm busy. We got 9,000 members in Colorado and, and, and 8,000 of them are in the labor council. <laughs> okay. I'm busy. I'm the only guy doing it. So um, if somebody says they don't want to do it, okay. I'm okay with that. I, I still got love for you. I'll still do what I can for you. But, you know, it, I'm just going to tell you, it's harder for me to advocate for your wages and your benefits um, and your working conditions outside of collective bargaining than, than if you have it. And that's the reason why non-bargaining lodges pay less is because I have fewer avenues to, to work on your behalf. So on to the next one. This, is, uh, this has been brought up um, a couple different times. It's, it, what benefits, and I know we kind of touched on this already, what benefits can we negotiate? Are there any limits to what can, cannot be negotiated? And are there any areas uh, you cannot include right out by bargaining? Well, I think there's, so within the statute, there are things that are mandatory subject to bargaining. There are things that are what are, and the mandatory subject to bargaining is if we bring a proposal or the city or county brings a proposal, the more required to discuss them. And we have to bargain those to impasse. Um, we could say no to what they're proposing, but we have to communicate about those. Uh, there are certain items that are permissive subjects. Uh, permissive subjects might be something that is not described as a mandatory subject. Um, and it could be, and they're normally things that are really kind of unique to the, to the individual department. Um, and if both parties agree, yeah, let's talk about this. So, for instance, in a permissive subject would be minimum manning. Like if we would like to discuss how many people should be on a shift and what's the, uh, what is the sphere of supervision for a sergeant, for instance, on a shift, should it be seven people as, as an example? We could discuss that and put it into agreement. Some agreements have those. But if we brought that up and the, and the county or the city said, uh, no, we're not interested in talking about that, for us to continue bargaining and asking to talk about that would be an unfair labor practice for us because we are essentially requiring them to bargain over something they don't have to. Um, and then there's prohibitive subjects of bargaining. There are certain management rights. We can't bargain who they're going to hire. We're not going to, you know, there are certain unions that operate in the construction industry, especially a hiring hall where an, a company has to hire from the union's hiring hall to put them on, uh, put them on a job. That doesn't exist in law enforcement. They get to make those decisions. Um, but we can talk about what they're going to pay someone when they first start and they become a full-time police officer or sheriff's deputy. And we can talk about the probationary term. So the majority of traditional benefits, wages, insurance, uh, leave time, uh, contributions to, uh, to insurance, um, bidding rights, if you're going to have a bid for patrol, for instance, about where you're going to work and the, mm -hmm. and the shift you're going to work, those are all mandatory subjects, and they have to discuss them. We have to discuss them. Um, so the reality is most things are we have the ability to bargain over that traditionally would put more money in your pocket. And then some that deal with, for instance, how you're promoted to sergeant. Um, so that we want a fair process and we don't want the process to change midstream to effectuate an individual person being promoted. We want the process to be based solely on merit. And that, that, Obviously, when, when that happens, people have a significant amount of faith in the people that are promoted. 
And this is a paramilitary organization that thrives on discipline. And when I say discipline, I mean personal self-discipline. And when you're asked to do certain things that are dangerous and the person asking you, you don't believe uh, that they should be the one making that decision, you have a tougher time responding to that. But if you believe that the process for him to get him or her to get there uh, was fair and they were chosen based on merit, you're going to follow that person into, in, into the most dangerous situations that you guys encounter. So those are, those are really the traditional things that we would bargain over. Um, and if a county came to us and said, this is not something we think we can do, even if it's a mandatory subject to bargaining, that doesn't mean that we can say you have to do it. Um, we have to take that into account and we listen. We sh- I, I, tell, I tell the folks that go to the actual table with us, it's normally four or five people from the department, you know, I don't make the decisions. Um, and ultimately, in many ways, they do. And so we're going to listen to what they have to say. We may disagree with it. We may think it's wrong. We even may think it's not true, but we're going to listen because part of this process is also listening ourselves because many of our members don't necessarily understand everything that goes into running uh, an agency. And I can tell you that to a person that has been through the process, they have a greater understanding of the operations of their agency after being involved in the bargaining process because there's an enormous education piece to this. You're talking from the executive staff. From the executive staff right. up and from the, from the rank and file down. Right. Where our, mem- our folks come in with a misguided idea about something and they may have a misunderstanding of what's going on. And when we have this real communication, frank communication, communication that we're not afraid one party is going to get mad and do something to the other, right. it, it's a lot more conducive to solving a problem. And our folks get educated too. It's, it's, it is the, the, there is no substitute for this process. You know, when I started doing collective bargaining in 1995 in my, my agency, I was a deputy. So I worked in that agency for five years without collective bargaining. And then we got collective bargaining rights. And then um, because I was uh, on the board of the, of the the local FOP there, I was on the negotiating team. And when I started doing that process, I had uh, a much more limited understanding of the way the agency ran. After just being in one contract negotiation, I had, I was, I had way more understanding of what the management's considerations were and how they made decisions, um, and how the the money got allocated, and how certain policies came to came to to be put in place. Um, and as I continued that process um, throughout my career, and I you know moved up in rank, um, the fact that I had been a person who had participated in collective bargaining all the way up until the time I was I was put into executive management, um, because in in Denver they can negotiate for people captain and below. Okay. So up until all the way up until the rank of captain, uh, I was still involved in the collective bargaining process. And, and when I ex- exceeded that rank and became a major and a division chief, um, and I, was, I wasn't participating in that situation anymore, I understood it from both sides. And so, but, but m- my process of, of having completed negotiations, been involved in negotiations, helped me understand it so that when I was executive level management, um, I, I, I was pretty well equipped to understand, you know, kind of the universe of how the agency was operating from both sides. Yeah. Um, which is, I think, the reason why the sheriff picked me to be a division chief, as he said. I want somebody who has that vision. Right. Um, who understands that from both sides. Can I ask a personal question? Sure. So when you were, uh, when you moved into executive position and you were interacting with the agreement and the CBA process, did your views change? About the CBA and, and things like that. No, um, because you know I didn't, I didn't switch from being on the the labor side to being on the management side in negotiations. I just I just wasn't participating in negotiations anymore. <laughs> so my only involvement with the, the agreement would be the enforcement of it. You know, right. the adherence to uh, making sure that we followed the, the the standards. So no, it didn't change, and it actually just because I all it does is it's the same thing with any kind of rules or policies. Once you know what the rules and the policies are, you, it's easy to understand what the, how the playing field works and how, how, it, how, it, how everything's laid out. This is what I have to do. It's like in the military, and you know, I'm a military guy. Um, 
you know, in the military, they tell you what the rules and the regulations are and, you know, the parameters for how you have to operate. And that's how those are. That's what you rely on. And you operate inside those those parameters. And law enforcement is the same way. Um, and, the, you know, the, the contract, the, the collective bargaining agreement is the same thing. It's just a document that says this is how this particular aspect is going to be handled. It doesn't change anything. It's, you know, uh, it's just, it's the same situation. And right now you have those things in policy, which can mm-hmm. go away you know, with the stroke of a pen in 15 seconds, regardless of who's in command or who's in charge or who's the sheriff or who's the commissioner, you know, who's the county administrator, those things can evaporate. The bargaining uh, agreement can't, um, but it's administered the same way as the policy. The policy says people get X amount of days of vacation or people get X amount of days of sick leave or people, you know, get to, um, you know, bid or, or vote for their, 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 their shift and their days off and that this is how that's done. It's the same situation. Anybody who can follow local policies can follow a collective bargaining agreement. Yeah, I think part of the fear for, and, not, and I'm not executive command staff, but mm-hmm. I think part of the fear is people that have the power and the decision-making capabilities a lot of times often fear giving some of that or even perceived giving some of that up. Where this, my understanding of it is we're just meeting at a table and we're talking about the benefits. Like we don't inter, we don't interfere with how necessarily a sheriff runs their agency it's a non it's a non-negotiable is that what they call them? right uh, it would be it would not it would be a per- permissive and or right. a, a prohibitive subject i mean the the mission of the sheriff's department won't change and the vision the sheriff has for what we're going to emphasize is not going to change so for instance if you know you, you have a, a sheriff that believes that the the core focus of our department needs to be our patrol division because that's that's what the community constituents want to see. The bargaining process isn't going to affect that in any way. How he runs the department, what, how we do use of force, how we train people, none of that changes. They control that completely. Um, you know, things that might change would be if we have a selection for a job like a canine officer. Is there going to be a fair process? Yes. Is he going to get to choose the most qualified person? Yes. Can you change the process in midstream because you don't like the, the results of it? No. But who would want to do that? Right. That, really, that really believes in the process that they are controlling. And, and so in many of these situations, we don't want to change the way they're doing business or the mission of the department. We just want to make sure we're getting paid better for doing it. Now, on, on the question between the relationship between the sheriff's department and the county commissioners, would collective bargaining stop the sheriff from being able to go to the county commissioners and asking for more money from a general fund for, say, shields or other equipment for the deputies? No. Um, and and I've talked a lot about this, and I've talked to sheriffs about this. Uh, when this law was, going, was being bounced around at the legislature, there were any number of sheriffs having any number of views about, uh, about how this was going to play out. And many of them had testified with me on other issues like Senate Bill 217. And we, we shared a commonality amongst, our, amongst the sheriffs and the chiefs association in, in dealing with some of the legislation that was being uh, proposed. And so these, these guys are my friends. I would consider them my friends. And they have different views on this. And we would argue about those views. Um, but the reality is they should want this. Because right now, they're the one single voice that can go ask for money from the county. And the county, if they are sideways with the sheriff, whether politically or personally, that sheriff can get stonewalled and get nothing accomplished. Nothing against the sheriff. The sheriff might be doing things that are absolutely correct. And they have he, has, he or she may have opposition within the county structure for a variety of reasons. But now we get to be the person to take up that arm and go over there and have those discussions. And they have to talk to us. They can tell the sheriff to buzz off. And he couldn't do a single thing about that. And sheriffs across the state have been told to buzz off by the county. And they know this. And those are the same folks that are are, the, are cheerleading the process. And so the reality is, if the sheriffs really looked at this objectively, they would recognize that this greatly benefits them and hardly affects the way that they're going to run the agency. Um, the one th- other thing that I would note about running the agency is that the sheriff still has certain authorities that are not going to be usurped by the bargaining process. And we want them 
to be able to run the sheriff's department. But we also, they, they should be cheerleading us. And you ask about Frank when he transitioned from, uh, from a bargaining unit position to a non-bargaining position to change his perspective. I can tell you on things of benefit and pay, our greatest cheerleaders are the command staff. Because you know why? If we get it, so do they. And anyone that tells you differently is lying to you because the reality is when they do something for the bargaining unit, everyone benefits. And they may not have to, but they'd be crazy not to because who in their right mind would promote to a position that has worse benefits than the people in the lower subordinate positions? It doesn't happen. So the reality is in many of the departments I've been negotiating for for 20 years, my biggest advocates are the chief of police, the deputy chiefs, and the lieutenants and captains. They couldn't wait until we got a bargaining agreement because the raise we got is the raise they got. And I don't know if you guys know, but when you get a percentage wage increase, if you're making more money, it equates to more money for you. <laughs> so the reality is I cannot see any detrimental impact to the command staff of the sheriff's department in this process. Right. We're wanting to work with them, not work against them. Yeah, and I think it was brought up, not to cut you off, Frank, but I think it was brought up from a certain friend of mine that did re did receive at his agency a lot of these benefits, such as short-barreled rifles, uh, small shields in every patrol car, you know, things like that. And then he brought it up as, well, if we go to this collective bargaining thing at my agency, th he was worried that that type of equipment wouldn't be brought out. And so the sheriff, um, the sheriff will still be going to the county commissioners uh, for funding around the things that are not going to be covered by the collective bargaining agreement. Um, every collective bargaining agreement, every contract has a has a section that's called management rights, and that basically preserves the rights of the management to do all the things that they traditionally do. Um, to run the agency and manage the agency and making decisions around the agencies. Like we talked about, we might be able to negotiate a, a promotional process. And it just says, this is how the process is going to work. It's still going to be the sheriff making the decision who to promote. Okay. It's that's because that's going to be a management right for, right for the sheriff to make that decision. Same thing with what kind of, what kind of vehicles are we going to use? What kind of, uh, firearms what you know how Wait, is you, how is the training how, how what kind of training are we going to be administering to our staff and and you know all the things that that, that deal with that equipment and training and and you know things that that, that deal with policy uh of of managing the agency and operating the agency the sheriff is still going to be talking to the commissioners about funding it's just that we're going to be talking to the benefits. county to the county about wages and benefits yeah right and I would just say finally that, you know, ultimately it's each bargaining uh, group's kind of decision-making process. But when I'm weighing whether I get to drive a brand new patrol car or one with 30,000 miles and me being able to send my children to college, I'm going to opt for the sending my children to college and driving the 30,000 mile patrol car. Yes. And so when they try to pit those interests against, against one another, I don't think that's fair because one, most of the things you're talking about are safety issues, making sure that people are safe and doing their job in the most safe and effective manner that they can. And if we're saying you have to give those up to get paid, we got a problem. So the reality is that though that money is still available for things that are actually necessary, but we might not be able to get some pet project, the 16th Bearcat, <laughs> if we want to get a 5% raise. But if you think that the Bearcat is worth more to you individually than the 5% raise, collective bargaining probably is not for you. Right. And we'll wrap this up. Frank, I'll start with you. Any, any closing remarks or anything that we didn't cover? We covered a lot. But anything that we didn't cover that you feel like people should know? Well, I think people just need to understand that the main aspect of collective bargaining is the members are the ones that control it um, and the decisions that are made are really based on what they have stated and indicated that are, are their interests and, and what they want addressed. Um, and again, the job of the FOP is to do what our members want, to, to improve their quality of life uh, and their family's life and to protect and advocate for our members. And that's what we've always done. You know, people don't have to believe. I mean, listen, if you don't believe in, in the FOP, then you shouldn't be a member. 
But this organization didn't get started to do anything but that. That's the reason why, you know, we, we were started over 100 years ago was, you know, two, two officers in Pittsburgh standing in the rain said, man, hey, you know, this job sucks in a lot of ways and we need to, we need to be able to do some things and advocate for some things that's going to improve it. Um, that's really what happened. And, and it grew into what we have now. That's what everybody who's in office in the FOP are people who are interested in, in furthering that legacy of advocacy because that's what we do. Uh, you lose a lot when you become a local leader in the FOP. It, in, in most cases, it, it negatively impacts your career. It doesn't enhance it. There are places in certain circumstances where it does enhance your career. I mean, I was kind of an outlier in that way. Um, because you know the sheriff said, "I want somebody who ha who has that experience." Um, but the reality, and then when he wasn't the sheriff anymore, I was out of a job, and that was it. You know, because people coming in didn't want that, and that's you know, the upper management they get to choose that, they get to make that. To politicians, elected officials, they get to make those decisions for executive level people, and that's just the way it is. But um, yeah, so that's what we're about. You you know, everything we do in the FOP, it's about improving that. For, for, for rank and file law enforcement officers. That's it. There'd be no other reason for us to exist. There's nobody lining their pockets, nobody making a ton of money uh, for being in the FOP. The national president of the FOP uh, makes about $70,000 a year, and we have almost 400,000 members. We're the oldest and the biggest law enforcement association in the country. The next biggest to us nationally is over three and a half times smaller than we are. And that person, the person who's the president of that organization, makes $200,000 a year. Who's really doing this for, for the interest of rank and file officers? Nobody's making, getting rich off of the FOP, not, not leaders. Um, we're given of ourselves, we always have, because we believe in this. And our record speaks for itself. Our record speaks for itself, okay? You know, you'll see and you'll know and you'll understand that elected officials come to us and seek our endorsement because of the credibility that we have, because of the credibility, because of the, the, the history and the legacy of what we've done and what we stand for. And so you can't, you can't love us one second and hate us the next. If we're good enough for you to come to, come to, to get our endorsement, um, you know, when you want to get elected to something, then we're good enough for you to have a conversation with when it's time to talk about you know, the, the, the general well-being of everybody who's wearing a uniform and a badge. That's all I have to say. Thanks, Barry. Sean, closing remarks, topics we didn't cover? Um, I, I think this, that it's a reminder that this is a democratic process. There's no one forcing this on uh, anyone in the state. Uh, we're here as a guide and an aid to the people at the ground floor that are working at these different agencies. And as Frank said, everybody in the FOP, by and large, is doing this on a volunteer basis. They're, they're doing it to many of them, the detriment of their careers. Um, and that's why I have, it's such an honor for me to represent these guys and gals because they're doing it for all the right reasons. And the right reasons are what Frank just described. I mean, I get to make money off this. I, I, I agree with that, and I recognize that. And my, I, I thank them every day. It's, it's, I couldn't have imagined a legal career that was like this because the reality is I get to do something that's meaningful to me every single day. It's hard. It's actually hard as hell. Um, and it is stressful, and it is, and it is difficult, but it is rewarding. And it means something, and it has a direct impact on people. And there's no other reason why people go to law school than those things. And I get the opportunity to do this. But I am never going to tell anybody that every single aspect of what I believe, they have to believe. They've got to come to that conclusion themselves. And as Frank said, if, if you are trying to split hairs about some, an organization being good for one thing but not good for the other, we're all the same organization. The direction is the same. The, the, the people are the same. What we intend to do is the same. And so this is a process that allows you to have a voice, and that's simply what it is. It's going to take time. There has to be a change of heart, but we're going to be part of the change process. We're going to, we believe that that change will be better for every organization that does this. And the reality is all the departments that are succeeding, all the ones that are top of the pay scales, 
almost all of them are bargaining. That's not an accident. It's just not. And we've been very successful in fostering positive relationships in those places. And I would, I would challenge anyone to go to those places and talk to the city manager or talk to the chief and talk about anything that we've done negatively for their department. They, we've had disagreements, sure, but they've been professional disagreements that we find resolution. And that's what was going to continue to be our primary goal in the collective bargaining process. Find resolution find common ground, work with the agencies to solve problems. That's it. Well, gentlemen, I appreciate your time. I think, uh, I think this was, I hope the listeners pull something out of this. And if they have any questions, they can feel free to reach out to me. I'll get them in contact uh, with those who can answer them like yourselves. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. okay. Thank, you. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot for having yeah, us. Thank you. Enjoyed it.